Galor aelod e i drefn a cyn i fi alor y prif wynidog rhwn siŵr y bydd yr aelodau am y mino gyda fi yn anfon ein cydymdeimladaeth bawb sydd wedi effeithio gan y digwyddiad erchyll yn Las Vegas ddoi. Yr eitem cyntaf yr agenda felly yw'r cwestiynau i'r prif wynidog a'r cwestiwn cyntaf Joyce Watson. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on how Wales has gained by being an ethnically diverse country? Yes, throughout our history, black, Asian and uh, minority ethnic people have brought skills and entrepreneurship to Wales. And as we celebrate Black History Month, the theme, our stars, our future, our history, supports our ambitions within prosperity for all. Uh, because we know that a prosperous Wales needs diverse, creative, highly skilled and adaptable people. Uh, I thank you, uh, First Minister, for that answer. And last week I was delighted to attend and speak at the launch of the 10th Welsh Black History Month. Events which are held throughout October help us to reflect on the rich heritage of Wales and the diverse makeup of its people and their contribution to shaping Wales. And it gives us uh, an opportunity as a parliamentary body to reach out to black and minority ethnic people and encourage them to become engaged with us and the work that we do. As you know, uh, First Minister, our next Assembly Apprenticeship Scheme uh, will be launched next year. And can I ask you, therefore, what steps uh, that the Welsh Government are taking to help uh, to promote applications uh, from black and ethnic communities? Well, we're providing £360,000 in the course of 2017 to 2020 for the All Wales Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Engagement Programme. Uh, providing information, of course, to the Welsh Government on key issues and challenges, and that will help us, of course, to uh, ensure uh, that we're able to uh, recruit in a way that fully reflects the population makeup of Wales. Mark Isherwood. Uh, Jock well, um, <coughs> Three weeks ago, I attended a meeting uh, in Wrexham with the Polish Ambassador from London, the Consul General from Manchester, uh, Council representative, various agencies in attendance, and of yeah, course yeah. representatives of the Polish and Portuguese uh, communities, um, talking about how we could develop a contact centre. Um, and in this case, the uh, Polish Consul talked about the Polish uh, Business Council, or uh, possibly, or Polish Community Business Clubs, possibly being able to raise the funding to access this. But need, we need somebody to facilitate a way forward, tackle the barriers that people in these communities are continuing uh, to face, and also, in consequence, reduce pressure on statutory services. How could the Welsh Government help facilitate uh, progress in this area? Well, we uh, look to work, of course, uh, through our engagement with the different communities, uh, through the various fora that we have, and also, of course, to work with, with the Polish ambassador and uh, Polish diplomatic representatives in the UK. Uh, we're more than happy to uh, work uh, with the ambassador in order to identify uh, where such groups exist in Wales and how we can best engage uh, with them. I'll write to the member. Uh, if I uh, write to the uh, Polish uh, ambassador, uh, perhaps uh, if I could use the, um, uh, I could enclose as part of the letter the words that he's used in this chamber, uh, then of course we can see how we can best work together uh, in order to uh, achieve the outcome that he's described. Bethan Jenkins. Um, First Minister, on Friday I was with the Ethnic Youth Support Team in Swansea and they were saying that they would like to have much more support uh, going into schools and education uh, venues in regards to trying to get communities to work together. And so in one um, school they um, had a white girl wearing a hijab and she walked down the street and then she came back and she said how different she felt she'd been treated because she was just wearing one piece of headwear that was different to how she uh, would usually dress. And I think these types of things would help uh, children who've never been introduced uh, to other communities or other ethnicities uh, in their lives to try and understand how it is to live in those everyday, uh, in those everyday experiences. So I was wondering if you were able to speak to, to them. I know they work closely with the Welsh Government in providing them with additional resource to go and do this in other schools across Wales to make sure that when we start at a young age, uh, those potential uh, problems may be alleviated by starting as early as we possibly can. But well, can I suggest that the organisation involved... Uh, goes through the usual route, uh, talks to the Minister's uh, officials, and then, of course, we consider what resources might be uh, made available in the future. Question by Janet finch Saunders. Yeah. Yeah. Will the First Minister make a statement on patient advocacy services in Wales? Yes, we're committed to providing effective patient advocacy services in Wales. 
Services are provided to adults by community health councils and local health boards are responsible for arranging the provision of advocacy services to children and specialist mental health advocates. Thank you. During our debate recently, your Health Cabinet Secretary was very much in favour of abolishing community health councils and replacing with a new body. Now, this is despite an inordinate amount of public objection. How ironic then, First Minister, that in my most recent correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary regarding a problematic constituent case, he has had the audacity to suggest that I recommend to my constituents approaching their CHC, in effect passing the book for the shortcomings of his and your health service. First Minister, would you not agree with me that this is rather duplicitous of the Cabinet Secretary? And would you also place on record your acknowledgement and support of the work that the Community Health Councils and their volunteers have carried out on behalf of our patients as an advocacy service over many years? Ah, duplicitous. That's, that's the word of the day, isn't it? We had that yesterday from the Secretary of State in his widely ignored speech. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I don't accept at all that the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has been uh, in any way duplicitous at all. I mean, of course, uh, he would uh, refer uh, a, a constituent of yours to an independent advocacy service. That's what exists under the current structure, and that's what, what will exist in the future, an independent service. The minister cannot be, by nature, independent. Uh, so I think the answer he's given to you is absolutely correct, that uh, if uh, your patient needs advocacy, it is right that that advocacy service should be independent. It's right, then, that the community health councils, uh, as they provide that service at this moment in time, and uh, we look to see, of course, what the responses will be to the white paper that uh, your constituent, I believe, has been given the uh, right advice based on what you've told me uh, in the uh, chamber today. First Minister, the Welsh Government in January 2017 announced veterans and armed forces, champions of health boards and NHS trusts in Wales. The Anarion Bevan Health Board that covers my constituents in Isloin named Brian Morby as the champion. Congratulations to him. What impact does the First Minister believe these champions are having on ensuring that local service plans provide support and that their local plans reflect the needs and priorities of the brave men and women of Wales who have bravely served our nation in our armed forces? Oh, very much so. Uh, we know, of course, that there are very effective uh, champions in many aspects of public life uh, in Wales, and they do much to influence positively the direction of the uh, government and, indeed, uh, uh, public uh, bodies and, and agencies. So, uh, yes, I very much recognise the work uh, that your constituent has done, as, have, as many others have done uh, across Wales, uh, because they add uh, to the knowledge that government has uh, in order for government to act in the uh, most appropriate way for the people. Caroline Jones. Diolchewydd. Uh, First Minister, an independent patient voice is vital, particularly for those who can't make themselves heard. We have made huge progress in providing advocates for people with mental health issues, but patient advocacy services are also vital to people with dementia. There have been calls for every person with dementia to have access to a skilled and independent advocate who understands dementia and is equipped to advocate effectively. First Minister, do you support this view and will you, online, uh, will you outline the actions your government is taking to improve advocacy services for people with dementia? Well, health boards are responsible for arranging the provision uh, of uh, general patient advocacy services for children and children and young people in receipt of uh, mental health care can be further supported to raise concerns through accessing independent mental health advocacy. All health boards in Wales have in place arrangements to provide mental health advocates trained in working with children and young people. That's true. And, of course, we want to make sure that the uh, patient voice is strengthened when it comes to mental health services for, uh, for adults. Uh, and we've done much, of course, uh, to uh, assist uh, those organisations who are helping people and their families who are dealing with uh, dementia, such as, for example, uh, pushing forward with uh, dementia-friendly uh, places so that people can go uh, and live their lives as long as possible in as familiar an environment as possible. Um, First Minister, homelessness is a blight on any civilised society. Have you noticed that the number of rough sleepers is currently increasing? The number of rough sleepers, according to the last count, is 141. That uh, count was, took place in November of 2016. It's difficult, of course, to count the number on a regular basis because it does fluctuate up and down, but she is right to identify 
the fact that rough sleeping is, is an issue, which is why uh, the Secretary will be giving his uh, statement on the budget uh, later. Uh, we will be looking to provide all the resources that we can in order to alleviate the problem. Homelessness is on the increase, First Minister, and that's from rough sleeping counts, applications for homelessness support, people in temporary accommodation, evictions, the lot. And here in Cardiff, the Wallach <coughs> estimates that there's been an 18% increase in rough sleeping compared to the same quarter in 2016. And it comes as no surprise to us, at least, that this is happening. Everyone predicted that this would happen as a result of welfare cuts, which, I remind you, started under the Blair government when Lord Freud was given his first minister job. But it was also predictable that Westminster's dysfunctional political system would ignore these warnings and go ahead with their cuts anyway. Why wasn't your government and your party more proactive in seeking the powers to not uh, have, to have to implement these cuts? Well, it's one thing to have the powers, it's another thing to have the money. Uh, it's one thing to, to say we're going to do something. If the money isn't there to do it, then it becomes more difficult. What have we done? Well, we've just announced an additional £2.6 million to support services for rough sleepers and young people. And crucially, we've introduced legislation to prevent homelessness in the first place. Dealing with people who are already on the streets is important, but surely it must be the case as well that prevention is a, a priority for us. The legislation has meant uh, more help for more people. Uh, and help at an earlier stage, including uh, rough sleepers. And the latest homelessness statistics for uh, the first quarter of uh, this financial year show a steady rate of success uh, in terms of increasing demand. 63% of all households threatened with homelessness had their homelessness prevented in Wales. That would not have happened anywhere else, and that's as a result of the legislation. First Minister, you can't condemn Westminster for callousness while yeah, still yeah. accepting that the powers to prevent homelessness remain in Westminster. You, you're right, you have recently reformed the homelessness system to adopt a more preventative approach, but clearly there remain a great number of people who have fallen through the very wide holes in your safety net. Now, if you accept that we are facing a homelessness crisis, and I'd be very surprised to hear you deny that we're facing a crisis, will you commit to abolishing the Pereira test to get rid of homelessness intentionality, ending priority need, so that everyone is entitled to a home? Well, the legislation has gone some way to addressing that. I mean, she, she and I are in a different position. I, I don't believe that it makes sense to devolve welfare, uh, because we know that Wales is a net recipient of the overall pot. I do agree with her that the actions of the Tory government have been heartless, uh, unthinking, uh, and have led to more people being homeless. I was in Brighton last week, and it was extremely noticeable uh, how bad the problem was in Brighton. We have a problem in, in, in Wales, we know that. It was far worse there. Uh, and I believe part of that is because the, in England they have not enacted legislation that have helped to pre pre prevent homelessness in the first place. The answer to this, of course, is to have a welfare system that uh, works for people, a welfare system that is compassionate, and a welfare system administered by a Labour government in London. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, recently the Cabinet Secretary for Education delivered a speech uh, which highlighted that there were secondary schools in Wales that until recently had not been entering a single pupil for a GCSE science exam. Not a single pupil in secondary schools in Wales. <coughs> Also, there had been a tendency for many schools to enter uh, pupils for the easier BTEC courses, where in 2016 there was a 99% pass rate. Now, Estin, in a recent report, have highlighted the difficulties that some science subjects face in the way they're taught within Wales, Welsh schools. Don't you think it is vital that we need, if we are going to be aspirational about delivering a high-wage economy, a skilled economy, that we have more pupils entered into the sciences? And what confidence can you give that in the PISA examinations in 2018, we will see real improvement in the sciences where we've gone back by 20, so from 505 to 485, from 206 to 216. It has to be a key area of improvement, yet on your watch, we've got schools that haven't been entering pupils for science at all. Well, first of all, uh, we have for some time in Wales been emphasising the need to create parity of esteem between the academic and the vocational. 
uh, and therefore we should not uh, make uh, negative comparisons between BTECs and GCSEs. Uh, one is a vocational qualification, the other is more of an academic qualification. Schools are appropriate, uh, will, will enter uh, candidates for the appropriate exam according to what they feel they need uh, in terms of their future skills. He asks about PISA. Well, we've seen GCSE results improve year after year. That is a good sign as far as PISA is concerned. We've seen improvements in a, uh, subjects at A level. That's a good uh, indication that uh, PISA will improve in the future. We have, of course, new exams. Uh, we've uh, made sure that they have been rolled out without great difficulty. We've taken the decision to postpone the introduction of the uh, curriculum. We think that's, that's the right decision, and we know that teachers and, and professionals have supported that. And, of course, we are building schools all around Wales, schools that would not be built if he were in my position. First Minister, that was a pathetic answer. Yeah. On yeah. your watch, on your watch, on your watch, <laughs> we have had secondary schools in Wales. And these aren't my comments, because we can't get the data. We've applied to the Welsh Government to have the data that the Cabinet Secretary based her speech on. Here's the speech. The speech is here. It's her remarks, not my remarks, that says how shameful it has been that under your government we have had secondary schools not entering a single, a single student for science GCSEs. Not A-levels, GCSEs. How on earth can you defend that when you've been First Minister for seven years? These are the remarks of your Cabinet Secretary, not mine. So how can we have confidence that we will see the improvements we need in the STEM subjects when we've had such a laissez-faire attitude from your government? Uh, th that was a response worthy of the Secretary of State for Wales, and that's not a compliment, by the way. Uh, the reality is the system has been changed. We've just introduced, of course, the new GCSEs. Uh, that, that has happened. So far from sitting back and doing nothing, we're encouraging schools to enter pupils for GCSEs and other qualifications, and at the right time, and at the right time. So they're not entering them early in order to get them through a particular subject, and the grades coming down as a result. And that is something that we have uh, done as a, uh, as a government. Well, uh, uh, it's uh, unlike David Melding to be uh, like this, but uh, clearly uh, this is something something has... Uh, uh, it caused him to be annoyed this morning, uh, uh, this, this afternoon. But uh, no, we're confident in what we're doing. We're confident in what we're doing in terms of changing the syllabus. We are confident in what we're doing in terms of results. We see results improving, both the GCSE and A level. We see money going into education in a way that's been deprived from schools by his party from England. We see schools being built across Wales that would not be built by his party if they were in power uh, here. Uh, and, of course, we want to make sure that as many of our pupils have as many opportunities as possible to enter examinations in order to get the qualifications that they need. That's exactly what we've done in terms of the system we've now introduced. First Minister, David Melding is most probably getting annoyed by your performance this afternoon, because it is a very laissez-faire attitude, I have to say. You can't defend a system that is not... You cannot defend a system that has not been entering GCSE students for the sciences and then stand there and try and defend it. I want to have confidence, First Minister, that we will see improvement. I want to see improvement in the Welsh education system. We all want to see that. But we had in the last GCSEs the worst results for 10 years. We've got the science results, the PISA examinations coming forward now in 2018. I asked you at the first question, where are we going to be? Give us an indicator of where we're going to be. Just give us something to come out of this First Minister's questions where we can mark your homework as to where science will be in 2018. Science entries are up. We changed the system in order to uh, partially to encourage schools to enter more, uh, more students and enter them at the, the time that it's appropriate for them. That has been done. Uh, he talks about the worst uh, GCSE results for 10 years. I do not recognise that if you so compare like with like. If he thinks that things are rosy in England, I suggest he has to look at, at what happened in England with the, uh, with the system there. And he, he makes that uh, comparison from, uh, from time to time. Look, we will make sure that the education system is properly financed according to the settlement we get from him and his government. If he wants to see, if he wants to see more money in the education, can I suggest he actually lobbies, because he's more effective than his parliamentary colleague, lobbies his colleagues in London to get more money into education across the UK and particularly to Wales. We could do a lot more with a fairer settlement. A billion pound bank to Northern Ireland, not a word, not a word from the party opposite, not a word. Let's see Wales get the same fair play and let's see if the Welsh Conservatives can stand up against their colleagues in Westminster. Arweinydd Group i'w Cep Neil Hamilton. Dwi'n dda llawydd. This afternoon... 
Yes, I, I knew that the chamber. I knew the chamber was circular, though. I didn't realise it revolved as well. But, but uh, uh, this afternoon we shall hear the outline budget from the finance secretary. Uh, but his room for manoeuvre is obviously limited by the nature of the funding of the Welsh Government. 92% of the money which the Welsh Government spends currently comes from uh, the United Kingdom Government by block grants. So the success of the Welsh economy and the ability of the Welsh Government to spend depends crucially upon the health of the UK economy, which in turn depends crucially upon the economic policies of the government at Westminster. Does he think that the consequences for Wales of the kind of spending plans which Jeremy Corbyn outlined last week in Brighton uh, would, in the long term, benefit the Welsh economy? He, he, they've been added up to about £312 billion. It must be one of the most expensive speeches in human history. That's £4.15 billion per minute, £69.3 million per second. Such a speech programme would actually bankrupt the UK economy and that could be nothing less than disastrous for Wales. It has never been cheaper to borrow. In 1945, a government came to power in the UK presiding over a wrecked country and a wrecked economy with far less money at its disposal, yet it managed to create the National Health Service, managed to uh, put industry back onto its feet, it managed to ensure that people's standard of living began to rise, it dealt uh, with a country that had been destroyed because of the effects of war. If they can do it, then a Labour government can do it now. We've had seven years of austerity and nothing has changed for the better. It's got worse and worse and worse. Seven wasted years. It's time for a change. <laughs> I don't want to debate economic history with the First Minister, but immediately after the war we, we did, of course, have the Marshall Aid programme, and actually there was a very substantial reduction in the proportion of, of debt to GDP during the course of the Attlee government from 1945 to 1951. When Tony Blair came to office in 1997, the national debt stood at £359 billion, and in his first term of office he actually reduced it further. In 2001 that was reduced to £317 billion. And then Gordon Brown uh, turned on the spending taps, and we all know what happened with the financial crisis in 2008. The, na the national debt, the national debt, now stands. The national debt now stands at nearly two trillion pounds, and we are spending every single year 56 billion pounds on debt interest alone. If the Welsh portion of that debt interest, which would be one twentieth, that's about £2 billion a year, was available to the Welsh Government to spend on the health service, social care, education, or whatever, Wales would be very much better off than it is now. All governments have to borrow. There are, well, there are very few governments that don't have to borrow, usually those that are oil rich. The reality is you borrow to invest. And what we are seeing at the moment is a government that is bumping the British economy off the ground. We know that uh, as far as uh, injections of money are concerned, that's not happening. The economy is not being stimulated. Now, he doesn't want me to lecture him on economic history. I will. And recent economic history, which he will remember, because he seemed to suggest that Gordon Brown was responsible for the world financial crash in 2008. The reality is the crash was, it was uh, caused by irresponsible banks uh, selling financial products to people who they knew full well would not be able to repay them. And then they, they bundled those, de those debts and sold them onto other banks, infecting the entire system. That's what happened. We are still living with the consequences of that. It's quite clear to me, then, that the old ways of doing things cannot be followed in the future. We need, well, a Keynesian injection of cash into the economy in order to make sure that we create more employment, that we put more money in people's pockets and stimulate the economy in that way. Because it's quite clear that over the past seven years, what's being done isn't working. Well, you, would, you would think from what the First Minister just said that there hadn't been a Labour government from 1997 to 2008 and the Chancellor Exchequer was not Gordon Brown in charge of banking regulation, <laughs> whereas we know that he believed in a light-touch regulation of banking, so he was a contributor to the financial crisis which ultimately engulfed him. But Jim Callaghan knew what it was like to cope with a financial crisis because I'm sure the First Minister will remember very well in 1976 he appeared at a rather different kind of Labour Party conference and said, we used to think you could spend your way out of recession and increase employment by boosting government spending. I tell you in all candour that that option no longer exists and so far as it ever did exist, it only worked on each occasion by injecting a bigger dose of inflation into the economy followed by a higher level of unemployment as the next step. Jeremy Corbyn, if he ever 
whoever did learn that lesson seems to have forgotten it. And his role as a kind of moth-eaten Santa Claus dipping into a bottomless bag of presents to dish out to gullible children is not the way forward for any sensible or realistic political party which has any designs upon holding the highest offices in the land. We have revealed to us this afternoon the UKIP strategy for dealing with appealing to young voters. You are all gullible children, is the way that they're going to be described in the future. So I can't see many of them voting UKIP in, in the future. In the 1970s, there were particular challenges with stagflation, as he should remember, because of the soaring price of oil as a result of the 1973 oil crisis. That knocked the usual economic cycle out of sync, and as a result, we saw rising unemployment and rising inflation at the same time, meaning that the uh, traditional ways of doing th uh, the traditional way of uh, injecting money into the economy to deal with high unemployment. I can give the leader of the opposition a lecture on economic history if he wants. He knows next to nothing about it. And so the circumstances of the 1970s are very, 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 very different. But what I can say to him about 1976 is, is a statistic for him. 1976 was the time in history when Britain was most equal. When Britain was most equal. Since then, the Tories have made it more and more and more unequal. And that's what a Labour government will change. Question three, Alina Morgan. Well, <laughs> Uh, the First Minister will be aware that last week in Labour Party conference, Angela Rayner, the Education Sec Shadow Education Secretary, suggested that a new Labour government would commit to ending period poverty in schools. Does the First Minister have any intention of introducing such a measure in Wales? Yes, I did uh, note the, uh, the announcement. It is something I know that uh, we will look at as, uh, as a government to see how it can be dealt with in the most effective uh, way. Uh, but it is uh, a, a concept uh, that needs to be examined uh, very closely in order to make sure that it can be dealt with effectively in Wales. Susie Davis. Um, First Minister, last week I visited Seven Trent's testing labs in Bridgenda. You may all know them already. Uh, and most of the senior team there were women. I mean, they weren't educated recently in Wales, I'm afraid, so it doesn't help you on Andrew, Andrew's question. But even so, it is a great example of women getting into good STEM careers. Um, they're also a good example of when a facility where you would normally expect a degree level of education, their, t their, their interest is now turning to the FE sector um, to see whether students from there can be brought into appropriate roles. And as we know... Um, People from poor backgrounds tend to use FE a little bit more. Um, Welsh Government announced in January that the Chief Scientific Officer for Wales was setting up an internal working group developing the talented women for a successful Wales report findings. So I'm wondering whether you can provide us with an update on that um, to see uh, when uh, we might be seeing some results on the back of it. I will write to the member with the date as to the publication of that document. Uh, in terms of the uh, pumping station, uh, I'll be there on Friday. So I'll be able to hear it first hand uh, their, their, what they have already said to, uh, to her. <coughs> Sean Gwenllia. <coughs> Mewn llythyr at gadeiri the pwyllgor cydroddoldeb llywodraeth leol a chymuneta ar gorffennaf yr ail o'r bynthag, fydd wedoedd y rysgrifennydd cabinet dros yr economi hyn. Ni fyddai'n ddoeth cyhoeddi cynllun gweithredu cenedlaethol ar gyfer tlodi. Ond nid ydy hyn yn ddatganiad gwbl rhyfeddol. Dim cynllun gweithredu penodol, dim targedau ar gyfer lleihau tlodi, dim monitro oherwydd dos na ddim byd i fonitro. Er gwaetha'r ffaith fod dros 300 o blant yn byw mewn tlodi yng Nghymru. Ydych chi'n cytuno efo fi fod hyn yn arwydd clir fod y llywodraeth lafur yma wedi troi chefn yn llwyr ar deuluoedd tlawd Cymru? Na, yw'r ateb i, uh, I hwnna, mae'n trodi nhw beth sy'n cael ei delio ar draws llywodraeth. Dwi ddim yn rhywbeth sydd dim ond yn dod o dan porffolio un gwynidog, a ni'n gwybod faint mor bwysig ma hwn. Uh, os ydych chi ar, ar uh, beth yn ddim yn gyhoeddi wrth os dweitha, uh, mae'n amlwg bod ni'n uh, styriau trodi fel rhywbeth sydd yn holl bwysig i, uh, I ddatrys uh, yma yng Nghymru, a'r ffordd i wneud hwnna'n ddigwrs i'w sicrhau bobl ar sgiliau sydd eisiau enw, bod yna gyfleon i bobl, y ffaith bod yna'n gallu cael uh, gofal plant am ddim. Rhywbeth ddigwrs sydd yn bolisi, ni, uh, nethon ni i, I, I sefyll yn yr etholiad, ni'n symud mlan, uh, en mwyn uh, gweithredu hwnna, ac wrth gwrs i sicrhau bod yna swyddi ar gael sydd yn talu'n dda. Does dim pob 
uh, lever in Gedani, or as the fighting go board board Anglina Kavlogeth, Anglina Athal, and with the Lord of the Dynasty Nedig, and Nimon Second High Bunish Lady Moy and Nigel Lady Hamri, Ermoin Dod Agavel, Adri Yavel at Lodi. Here we are, Anka Davis. Dear Clever. First Minister, the Child po Poverty Action Group has uh, identified very early on that the way that universal credit is structured has, poses a real risk to the financial autonomy of women in the household. It actually undermines their ability to be autonomous and to have their financial independence. We now know from Citizens Advice Cymru that some people in the pilot areas, some women, are given up work due to childcare issues as a direct result of the design and the rollout of universal credit as it is. And we now know, of course, this week, according to the government's own figures, that over 80%, over 80% of recipients of universal credit that has been rolled out are now falling into rent arrears. The government's own pilot areas are showing it is an unmitigated disaster and it is driving young women, but also all people, into poverty. Could I ask the First Minister what further representations he can make to the UK government because the impact in all of our communities is going to be significant? Well, we'll continue to make those representations, but we'll have to get in a queue. I mean, their own MPs yes. Yes, are, are saying that the, uh, yeah. the rollout should be, should be stopped. If I could sum up the attitude of the Conservative government, it's this. Uh, lessen the financial burden on the rich, cut tax, and increase the financial burden on the, on the poorest. Getting your tax credit, the bedroom tax, universal credit, and we know, of course, uh, that on top of that, they do these things incompetently, and that's what the, uh, the current rollout of the universal credit is doing. The leader of the opposition finds it funny. When you talk about welfare, is it funny? Well, I'll, I'll, why does he go and talk to people who are affected by this? Why is he going to talk to people who are at threat of homelessness? Why is he going to talk to people who find themselves in a position where they're going to rent a And then he might learn what real life is actually about. Because we deal with these issues, we deal with these issues on a regular basis, on a constituency basis. And we see the inhumanity of universal credit along with so many other of the policies developed by a Conservative government who benefit only the richest. Question Pedwar Neil Hamilton. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the rail network in Mid and West Wales? Well, devolution of funding for rail infrastructure remains with the UK Government. They have refused to devolve that. Despite this position, since 2011, the Welsh Government has invested around £200 million into a programme of rail infrastructure improvements, including additional and enhanced rail services in the Mid and West. I thank the First Minister for that response. We welcome the Welsh Government's funding for a feasibility study to reopen the Aberystwyth to Carmarthen railway line. Uh, I'm sure he'll agree with me that the best way to revive railway lines which were closed largely in the 1960s in the beaching plan will be to produce uh, low-cost opportunities <coughs> For the, uh, the the train uh, uh, um, for, for the the trains and and the carriages which will work on the track because uh, it's the operating costs which are going to be the big stumbling block. Uh, there's been an estimate of 700 million pounds uh, total cost to reopen this particular line, but there's been some very encouraging studies done of no frills trains being manufactured uh, 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 using lightweight materials and running at low speeds. Uh, uh, which may be introduced in the next two years uh, as a result of a £4 million trial. So will the First Minister uh, do everything he can to encourage the introduction of this new technology, which will offer the opportunity to open up perhaps many more lines in rural Wales which were closed years ago? No, no I don't. I mean, what he's talking about is light rail. Uh, yes. It's a model that's used for suburban rails and for short journeys. Uh, I think a 50-mile journey between Kamala and Aberystwyth is best served by uh, a, a light rail carriage with hard seating, uh, for example, uh, we, without the, the kind of facilities you'd expect from a, a longer distance uh, train. Uh, and of course, with, uh, with light rail, uh, you end up in a situation where it's true it's cheaper because the signal requirements are not the same, uh, for example, but the comfort levels are way, way lower. And I don't think people uh, in, in the west of our country should, should have a, a train service that is far less comfortable uh, than would be expected a, a, along a, an equivalent route in, in England. If we're going you know, to move forward, it is a, you know, it's a significant challenge, <coughs> underestimated, a significant challenge and a significant cost uh, to reinstate the, the Amherst to the Carmarthen line. But if it's going to be done, it's got to be done properly. Russell George. 
Yeah. Uh, First Minister, I was uh, pleased that the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that Carno Station will be uh, included in the current Stage 2 assessment process for new stations in Wales. A petition uh, will also be uh, submitted to the Assembly tomorrow uh, from the Carno Station Action Group, ten years after the first petition, urging the Government to reopen uh, Carno Station uh, within a five-year timescale. Uh, now that the Cabinet Secretary has announced that Carno will be considered, uh, will you outline what the next steps are during this process, and do you feel that five years is a realistic timetable for the reopening of Carno Station? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, ju just to inform the member, the next stage is that, as he knows, the Cabinet Secretary has decided to include Carno in the current round of Stage 2 uh, assessments. What does that involve? It involves obtaining information from Network Rail on deliverability and operational considerations on the prioritised stations. In addition, a standard assessment model is being run to assess the anticipated demand at the proposed stations as well. I know that the Cabinet Secretary has asked officials to engage with the Action Group as part of the Stage 2 uh, process. So that, that's where we are now, but he will know, of course, what our, what our intention is. There are many unknowns. When you deal with network rail, <laughs> it, it's not always clear what the, uh, the challenges are. We've found that in the past where uh, Problems have been identified that were not known uh, at the time that an announcement was, uh, was made, but that is, it is our intention. He will know to, uh, to reopen Carnot, pending, of course, the assessment. Simon Thomas. An all between the all or with my Pivani dog, our Guinea dog, does the economy with the Guide on a Gofenol, Mar, so what's the personal you board, Vas Nachvind and Mindy Guchwin, he board a Puever Sound, Nar Arian Sound, where the Datgenoli, E Lord Red Cummy. Actually, my Lord with Camille put purpose in the Warden Argent, Dross Lord with San Stefan. Ostana Svetra, Gaiovini Chim Plumpak and Blan, and Golaini Bidigwidov, each of the Nadio Abatawe, Adichi and Vivied, and Lord with San Stefan, he does Cluido Puever Sound Mount Weed, Akan Buisig, he does Cluido Arian Sound Mount Weed and Augusta. Ostana Nade, as we did in Milan, and Plumpak and Blan. Uh, and the popular solution on a very minority EY3 just just him arrow now uh be bit with a problem and a pen draw and he wants to get high but a franchise in Milan and Michel Britwell a deliver and the shallow cuz get her in debe hebe and wants to get high but un the aspect in in case I need but the was on route ach so on route ach so nobody that can all your kathy deb are puere in in a tro kinta and we get puere i i i i uh, 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 network rail. Do not them get any arhen or breed. So, actually, my line is that yet for the with on a path on busy boys again. You get with ready now. Dross Bobo can remember for the demon boss civil plan. Joyce Watson. Dear Fire with First Minister, there was an awful lot uh, to welcome in the Transport Minister's uh, latest statement on the next franchise. And what was particularly welcome was uh, the commitment to keep a guard on every uh, single service, something that people have campaigned quite heavily uh, to see, and they welcome it. The other commitment was that uh, the new rolling stock should be maintained by workers, ideally here in Wales. And very recently, I had a tour around uh, the investment that's been made in the Mahantleth depot and met some of the 33 highly skilled employees uh, that reside there and work there. Um, so going forward, um, First Minister, uh, can I ask that uh, we will do all that we can to ensure a positive future for that that we've already invested in, in both Mahantli Station and the people who work there? Absolutely. If I remember rightly, Mahantli had a depot it did in the 80s, then it closed, then it reopened, uh, because it was needed, clearly, to uh, the service train on the, on the central Wales line and, of course, on the, on the Cambrian uh, coastline. So, yes, we want to make sure that not only we keep a network of, of, a network of depots, but we increase the number in the future, because we know that there will be new rolling stock, there will be uh, uh, new modes of transport that we will look at, and it's uh, important, then, uh, that the uh, equipment is, is maintained in Wales as far as possible. Question Pimp, David Rowlands. Uh, will the First Minister outline how the Welsh Government measures the success of its wealth creation policies? Well, it's important to consider the performance of the Welsh economy using a basket of indicators, uh, not look at one individual uh, measure. Uh, and, of course, prosperity for all shows the way forward. The uh, plans that will follow uh, will provide greater detail. 
Uh, well, I thank you for that answer, First Minister. But in measuring not only wealth creation, but also <laughs> health, <laughs> education, housing provision, etc., is Ron Davis, the former Labour Welsh Secretary, correct when he says, after 20 years of a Labour-controlled Welsh Assembly, Wales is now poorer than it was 20 years ago? And this former Labour luminary went on to say that he is not able to name a single initiative that has improved the lives of the people of Wales. Surely, First Minister, you have to agree this is, da this is as damning an, an analysis of Labour policies since devolution as any expressed in this chamber. Uh, no, is the answer. Now, where do we start? Let's start with Jobs Growth Wales, shall we? Uh, the fact that so many people were helped to uh, get into uh, the jobs, young people were given training. Uh, let's look at the, the help that was given to workers to keep their jobs when the, when the recession hit hard in 2008 to uh, 2009. Let's talk about the people who are, are alive because of the Human Transplantation Act supported cross-party across uh, this chamber. Let's look at the fact we have the best foreign direct investment figures for 30 years. Let's look at our employment levels. I suspect, really, that Ron needs to read a few more papers. Mohamed Ashka. Of small businesses, the Federation of Small Businesses has claimed that Welsh government offices overseas have failed in their aim of boosting exports to those countries. Figures suggest that export to those countries have in fact fallen between 2013 to 2016, down 13% to the United States, down 22% to Belgium, and 55% to Japan. First Minister, what plan does the Welsh Government have to review the effectiveness of its overseas offices in boosting trade with the countries in which they are located? Well, it's fallen into a trap there set for him by the UK government because what has happened is the methodology has changed so that if you have, if I remember rightly, if you have a factory in Wales that is exporting but its headquarters is in England, it's counted as an English export. That's the problem. Uh, so all of a sudden we see the sudden changes in the export figures, be not because physically less goods or fewer goods are being exported, but it's because they're counted as having come from England because the headquarters is, is in England. And we know that many organisations in Wales that, that manufacture don't have their headquarters in Wales. He asks a question, what are we doing to uh, boost our presence overseas? Uh, we are uh, moving ahead with a strategy to do just that. Uh, the, the balance that has to be struck is between do you boost an existing office or do you open a new office? Now, we commissioned work from PPIW that gave us information as to how we should approach that. And over the next uh, few months, uh, members will hear of uh, new office openings and, of course, boosting of staff abroad in order to make sure that we, we boost our presence, working quite often uh, with, with DIT, uh, in fact, most often with, with DIT, but in those markets where Wales has a strong presence and needs to, to uh, strengthen its presence in the future. Adam Price. Isn't it true, though, First Minister, that despite what he said about unemployment levels, and that, that, that is, is welcome, that they, they dipped below the UK average for a period in the, the early 90s as, as well, didn't they? But the, the problem is, in terms of income, in terms of prosperity, uh, you, can you, can, you can choose any number of a basket of indi indicators, whether it's average, uh, uh, average earnings, household disposable income, GVA per capita, income per hour worked, etc. We have gone backwards compared to where we were at the beginning of devolution, and that wasn't what, what was promised. So where are we going wrong, and are, what is the indicator? What, how are we going to measure, the, uh, hopefully, success that will come at some point in the future? Well, it's not just we've gone backwards, that people are somehow poorer than they were. What is correct to say is that as our GDP, if you want to measure GDHI as well, has gone up, uh, it has not improved at the same rate as other parts of the UK. I think that's the accurate uh, description. He asked the question, what do we do about it? The heart of it all is skills. It's skills. What happened uh, at the beginning of devolution is we did see a lot of those uh, businesses who I think came here because of the money, who provided unskilled work, they left. They went to Hungary. It happened a business in my own constituency. They went to Hungary. They went to lower cost economies because that's all they wanted to do was, was to manufacture cheaply. Now, we can't play that game, uh, nor should we try and do it. So the focus now heavily is on skills. One of the questions we've always um, been asked by overseas investors is, have your people got the skills that we need in order for us to be able to, to function in Wales? And increasingly, of course, the answer is, is yes. We work very closely with, with FE colleges, we work with our universities in a way that 10 years ago wasn't happening. Our universities were not interested in working uh, towards economic development at that point. They saw themselves purely as academic institutions. In fairness to them, they've changed. 
it will take some time uh, for the fruit of that work to, uh, to come through. But we are seeing investors coming to Wales now that bluntly wouldn't have come 20 years ago. Uh, High-end investors who are paying uh, more in terms of the, the jobs that they, uh, that they create. What's key now is to keep on moving on that track, not just in terms of FDI. He will make the point, I understand, in terms of encouraging SMEs in Wales. It's not a, a question of one or the other. And that's exactly what we, do, what we want to do as well. And working again with the universities and others, making sure that young entrepreneurs who have good ideas get the support they need to put those ideas into practice. Increasingly across Wales, we are now seeing those businesses starting to be created and to grow. Question Heaven David. Will the First Minister make a statement on the implementation of Qualified for Life Curriculum for Wales or Curriculum for Life? Well, on the 26th of September, the Cabinet Secretary for Education launched Education in Wales, our national mission. That reaffirms our commitment to building a transformational uh, curriculum in order to deliver a better education system for Wales. Uh, and I broadly welcome the Welsh Government's approach to implementing the recommendations of uh, Professor Graham Donaldson. Uh, but members will be aware of um, Professor Donaldson's uh, comments that were reported by the BBC this morning, um, in which he remarked that progress remained good, but also cautioned against any loss of momentum in the whole dynamic of this reform. Um, what discussions has the Welsh Government had with Professor Donaldson with regard to the changes that were announced by the Cabinet Secretary for Education last week? Um, and uh, what would be the First Minister's response to um, Professor Donaldson's concerns about a potential loss of momentum? Well, Professor Donaldson actually oversees the implementation board. Uh, he agrees that we've made the right decision to introduce the curriculum as a phased rollout rather than a, a big bang. The approach will mean that all schools have the time to engage with the development of the curriculum and be fully prepared, of course, for the changes. Uh, OECD have already said that uh, we need to continue our drive to create a curriculum for the 21st century, and that's what we will do, but at the appropriate pace. Darren Miller. Yes, uh, First Minister, while we welcome the uh, postponement of the implementation of the curriculum, one aspect which still concerns us is the fact that secondary schools will be required to deliver two curriculums, uh, two curricula, should I say, uh, four pupils in those schools for a period of five years. Now, that's going to cause absolute havoc, and I believe it's a recipe for chaos for particularly newly qualified teachers coming into the system who will have been trained to deliver a new curriculum but are having to deliver the old, uh, and for the already burdened profession that we have out there, 70-odd percent of which said that they felt overworked and stressed because of their uh, workload. So, what are you going to do to make sure that schools are geared up to deliver two curricula uh, to the pupils uh, in those schools and ensure that pupil attainment doesn't dip as a result and that staff aren't overworked more so than they are now? Well, if that was a concern, then the teaching unions wouldn't support this, but they have. They have supported the, for, supported the phase of implementation. Teaching skills are transferable. Uh, in some of the cases, somebody is, is, is trained to teach a particular curriculum. Uh, they have teaching skills that they adapt according to the curriculum that's, uh, that's before them. And it's hardly unknown, of course, for schools to, to teach different curriculums at the same time. When the national curriculum came in, uh, you know, schools had to the gear up for that. So there was often overlap at that point. Foundation phase was the same. I mean, you know, my father worked in education in the 80s, and I can tell you, he, things used to change almost on, on, almost on a half yearly basis uh, that the teachers had to deal with. So obsessed were ministers at that time. Not, they weren't Welsh Service ministers, they didn't have control over education then, uh, over, over the syllabus. Teachers found themselves having to satisfy the whims of ministers who wanted to change things all the time. Now, that surely is not the best approach. It's hugely important that we don't introduce a curriculum until the profession is ready. They've indicated they're content with this approach, uh, and that is why we've taken the approach that we have. Question side, Clear Griffith. Well, the Echid Privas called Betsy Carvalho, seen Gedachev Nogeth and Hamgir Hafordi Guithio Bill, or the Recruitio Ragor Unnerses. Well, uh, yn ôl y cyfryd wethar, oedd 92 o swyddi uh, nyrsys yn ysbytu'r examaelor uh, yn wag, gyda nifer wrth gwrs cynyddol y nyrsys yn agos ai at oed ymddeol yno hefyd. Nawr, mae prinder uh, uh, niferoedd yn awr nyrsys yn golygu bod nyrsys arbennigol erbyn hyn yn gyson yn gorfod gweithio ar wardiau cyffredinol, ac mae'n argyfwng dyddiol yn yr ysbytu, sef y mwyaf, wrth gwrs, yng Ngogledd Cymru. Nawr, mae'r recrutio tramor Dridwawr y bwrdd iechyd yn India a Barcelona drwy y siantau preifiad wedi bod yn fethiant llwyr. Dim ond pedwar uh, uh, nyrs o India ar enghraifft sydd wedi llwyddo i, i basio'r prawf iaith. Felly, 
ar ôl y methiant cynllunio'r gweithlu y llywodraeth chi, dros nifer fawr o blynyddoedd, ar ôl gosod bwrdd iechyd Betsi Cydwaled er mewn mesurau arbennig ers dros ddwy flynydd a harner erbyn hyn. Ydych chi yn derbyn cyfrifoldeb am y sefyllfa drianus yma? Yn ei gweld bod pethau yn gwella er enghraifft. Mae yna gynyddiad wedi bod yn nifer o yna sydd sydd yn hyfforddi yn y gogledd, mae'r nifer nawr yn mwy achau yna unrhyw flwyddyn o'r ddegmledd diwetha. So felly ni wedi bydd soddi mewn recrutio a hefyd wrth gwrs mewn hyfforddi. Mwyna di'n meddwl bod 13 y cant o gynyddiad wedi bod yn nifer o lefydd hyfforddi nyrsio yng Nghymru yn ystod y flwyddyn ariannol hyn. Ni wedi nawr 5 miliwn o bysoddiad mewn i hyfforddi. Mwyna meddwl bod yna 2,000 o fyfyrwyr newydd yn gallu ystudio rhaglenni gofal iechyd yng Nghymru ar draws Cymru. So, na, un her wrth gwrs yw'r ffaith bod bod ddim yn mwyn dod fyd yna sy'n ei ddim yn agor. O achos, Brexit, un rheswm, a ffaith bod ddim yn creu bod yna unrhyw athro groesod gyda yma nawr. Mwyna wrth gwrs i'r ddigwyddo blwyddyn diwetha. Ond er mwyn delio'r hynna, ni'n deall bod rhaid y ffordd i mwy o nyrsys yng Nghymru, a dyna pam ni'n gweld wrth gwrs cynyddiad sylweddol yn y ffyrgerau sydd yn y ffordd i. Ac yn ôl â chwestiwn o i thlu waters. What statement has the First Minister made of the Future Generation Commissioner's submission to the M4 Public Inquiry? Well, of course, uh, the submission is, is welcome. It's important that the uh, public inquiry is, is uh, open and, uh, and detailed, and that, of course, is uh, what is happening at the moment. Thank you. In its evidence to the M4 Public Inquiry, the Government acknowledged that a new motorway will inflict long-term harm, but this will be outweighed by the short-term economic benefits. The Government's own independent adviser, the Future Generations Commissioner, has now said that this is incompatible with the well-being of the Future Generations Act. The watchdog of the Act says that these trade-offs are no longer lawful in Wales. Would the First Minister agree to set up an expert group to quickly design a solution to the congestion on the M4 that is compatible with a law that we passed? Well, that is precisely what's happening now, because we have got an independent inquiry that is looking at the M4. It was designed to be uh, as, uh, as broad as possible, so it didn't just look at one particular uh, scheme. That's what it's doing. Uh, and so it's important that that inquiry is able to uh, report uh, dispassionately and independently, uh, considering all the evidence before it.